Hi folks, this is your colleague Nick Mount with what I hope will be a brief and clear introduction to Zoom. Like Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom is a video conferencing program used for holding what the industry calls meetings and what we still fondly remember as classes. Unlike Blackboard Collaborate, it is not available within Quercus. As of June the 19th, the University of Toronto has provisionally approved its use of the university for teaching and meetings, but as I speak, there is no U of T licensed version available, though I gather one is in the works. Uh, at the moment, though, to use it, uh, you would have to create an account and download and install the small program or app, uh, so we will do that uh, by going to Zoom's website. If you prefer a textual introduction to Zoom, our graduate student, Nicole Birch Bailey, has prepared an excellent introduction in PDF format, complete with screen captures, which you can access through the link below. It's a little bit out of date uh, because we prepared in March uh, in the world and Zoom has changed a bit since then, but the basics will be the same. Um, and you may still find what follows helpful as a supplement to that. Uh, so let's go to the website and sign up. So here we are at the, the Zoom homepage, and these are the four versions that they offer. Of the four, the only two that I think most of us would be likely to choose between is either Basic for free or Pro for $20 a month. Uh, the free version does a lot of things. I mean, it's all any student should ever need. Uh, if they're not hosting meetings, they're really joining them. This is all your students will need. Um, and it will include up to 100 participants. Um, and actually, at the moment, uh, Zoom has removed this time limit for any user with an educational email address. So if you do create a free account in Zoom, be sure to use your uToronto email address. Um, because if you don't, uh, Gmail, then, then this, this limit is still in place. But for those with an institutional email address, it is suspended. Of course, nobody knows how long that suspension will last for so partly for that and because I think I kind of owe it back to Zoom for what they've they've done for the educational community I have myself subscribed to the pro version I pay for it out of my ADFA fund and uh, the Pi fund which we've recently introduced you um, would also cover it. It does include a lot of additional functionality things like assigning different roles to TAs um, recording that sort of thing things I can show you when we get inside of it and uh, it also allows you, and this is critical, if you, if you don't have a very large hard drive, it allows you to save some of your recordings in the Zoom cloud. It gives you access to their recording system. So that was my choice. You make yours, create an account, install the program, and uh, then we can talk about how to run it. So now you've created an account and installed the program. Uh, students who don't already have it installed, which honestly will not be many at this point, uh, will receive a link uh, with instructions for installing Zoom with your initial invitation. You can access Zoom through a web browser, uh, Safari, Chrome, Firefox, uh, by downloading uh, the small program for PC or Mac from Zoom's website for free, uh, or by downloading a mobile app for your phone uh, from either Google Play or the Apple App Store, depending on which god you worship. Uh, once you've done that, once you've decided on your preferred program or app, uh, the first step I'd say would be to log into your account and familiarize yourself with some of the basic settings. So here's uh, my account page. And uh, before we get into scheduling a, a class or, or using Zoom itself, I'd like to walk you through some of the settings uh, over here. Uh, most of these, there's a lot of them, and uh, most of them you won't really need to tinker with, and I would recommend just leaving the default, but it's worth flagging a few of them, if only so you know about the things that you might want to adapt later as you become more used to it. So starting under this tab here, uh, Meetings, I have this one turned on myself, just so that the students see me when I enter the room, the same as they would in real life. I tend to leave this one off. This is for the students, so they can decide when they want the cameras to be turned on and when they want me to see them. Um, audio type, the default is actually this one. I taught this way uh, through an entire summer class. No student ever used a phone to join, and I have some concerns about it. There have been issues with Blackboard Collaborate about students incurring uh, cell phone charges through American cellular networks using a phone. So I think I'm going to try in the future to experiment with just leaving it on computer audio to avoid that possibility altogether. Um, I enable this one. It isn't enabled by default, but I enable this one. It makes sense to me that just as in a real class, uh, students should be encouraged uh, to speak and see each other before the teacher arrives. 
This one I also uh, is set off by default, but I enable it. Um, this is mostly just to cut down on background noises, not so I can't hear them. They can turn on their microphone anytime they like, but this way everybody's mic's turned off, it cuts down on background noise, and they can hear me better when I start speaking. This is a chat, a function I'll show you briefly later. Uh, enable this. It's, a, I think, one of the best teaching tools available to us for online and dual delivery purposes, allowing students to, to speak with each other. Allow the host to add co-hosts. Um, it gives you the ability, to, as I say, to designate a TA. As a, as a host or co-host to run the class for you or run a section of the class for you. Polls, uh, also turned off by default. I'm going to experiment with that this fall. Um, let you um, survey the class on questions. Um, I leave this one turned on. This one is also turned off by default. I've toggled it on. The controls can disappear on you at the bottom of the screen, so I find for me that I like to know where they are. There's not many of them, but I, I like to know where they are. I turn on the breakout room. Um, it's, it's essentially a feature that allows, and the same as in Blackboard Collaborate, allows you to, to split the class up into small groups to have separate discussions. It's essentially the digital version of group discussion. Um, waiting rooms has been the, the, the controversial one in the Zoom environment. There's been some issues with, I gather, people crashing Zoom meetings. I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about that. It's a public university. Um, I've had people wander into my classes before, and I'm generally fine with that. Um, so I'm not as concerned about it as some people are. But essentially the way it works is that if anybody who joins the meeting gets placed in a waiting room or a lobby first, and then you as the instructor elect to let them into the class when it begins, either collectively or individually. I, I don't use it myself, but you might want to. Okay, if we go back now, that's the main settings I wanted to flag under meeting, under recording. The only one that I would really flag here is, uh, yeah, to enable automatic recordings. Um, in this case, I prefer to record on my computer, but I have a pretty large hard drive. So that, that'll be up to you and what you have. Um, I only do that because uh, I might forget to record it. I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do with these recordings just yet, especially for the large class. At the moment, and for my summer class, I just recorded them in case I might need them uh, for an accommodation. I didn't, um, so I've now deleted them. But uh, this is where you would do it. So you'd have them as a backup or for teaching purposes, for asynchronous teaching. So now you're all set, and the next step would be to actually create a meeting or schedule a class. And you would do that by clicking this button. So you're going to give a name to your class. Let's call it Awesome Books, because aren't they all? Uh, this is entirely optional. Students won't see this. It's just for your use. And let's say that it begins uh, September 1st on a Tuesday, and it starts at 2 p.m. And I'm going to set it for two hours per meeting. And you down here, you can see it's a recurring meeting. And I'm going to say it meets weekly, and it meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then you can set it up so that it ends after a certain number of weeks, let's say 12 weeks for the term. I don't use registration myself. So you may wish to. Uh, these are the options. It's up to you. Uh, meeting passport is automatic. And the rest of these are settings that you have already configured in your general settings, but can now be toggled on or off individually for specific classes or purposes. So I've left the, my camera on. I've left the student's camera off initially. I've used computer audio for both of us. I've let the students join the class before me, though I've muted them until uh, they speak, and I've not enabled the waiting room, and I record the meeting automatically. Uh, in this case, in my case, on my computer rather than in the cloud. So that's done. Save it. And now the meeting has been created. This is the link for the meeting, and you can copy the invitation. And then I simply copy this to my clipboard. And then you could email this to your students, or much more likely and easier, is send it to them via a Quercus announcement, which they would then be able to access and use for every meeting of the class. And so once you've done all that, then your next step is to actually hold a class in Zoom. So let's do that. So as the teacher, you can click the Start button from within your account or clicking the same link that you sent to your students. Either will work and they will work the same way. So I start this. You might see a prompt like this, in which case it opens in meetings. And it will take a second to dial me in. 
and there we are and I'm gonna join with my computer audio you can test your speaker and your microphone if you like and there we are so here I am in a zoom class by myself which is odd so I'll just walk you through the zoom controls uh, starting over here with like, the most commonly used button uh, mute and unmute your microphone uh, you can also use this to change the microphone that you're using this one turns your camera on and off uh, not for ending a class uh, so much as for taking a break just when you take a break turn your camera off turn your microphone off ask your students to do the same participants will show you a list of all the students that are in the room um, I just temporarily asked my wife to join just so I can show you from her office the faculty of law and I put her in the waiting room so I'll admit her here and I can just show you some of the functions that would be available to you so as a student you can unmute them you can ask them to start their camera, make them the host, allow them to record it, um, put in a waiting room, or if they're being truly obnoxious, you know, remove them from the meeting. The, the students in a student view, they will also see down here a button that says raise hand and with a little blue icon of a hand. And when they do that, you would see it appear beside their names in order over here and in their window up here. And once you see that, you can just uh, ask them to speak or, or wait until a certain amount of questions accumulate to your choice. Polls is a useful feature that I haven't yet used, but I'm going to experiment with it. You can create a poll, very easy to do, and then just uh, ask the students to, to survey. It's useful for in-class surveys, responses to simple questions, that kind of thing chat uh, this one uh, students have the option to use this independently of you and I would encourage you to let them do that they can chat with one another uh, it's up to you um, I wouldn't feel any need myself to, to, to monitor this throughout the class if it's too confusing for you for starters but you could simply pause every 15 minutes or so and say you know, direct questions to me and then look at that chat window and respond as you like the share screen button here is another uh, very like very commonly used tool you can use this to share uh, files that you have open a variety of things starting with something like a whiteboard and so on the whiteboard you know you can draw or you can type text into it uh, and uh, you can also students can contribute to this so they can collaboratively create some kind of masterpiece here I'm not exactly sure what but but it maybe not so helpful for English classes but you never know um, you can also share uh, this is likely to be much more common uh, a PowerPoint file so if I share that here I'll just give you a little tip uh, that, that uh, normally when you're using PowerPoint in a classroom if you go into slideshow set up slideshow by default it would be this button toggled on and that shows the, the PowerPoint slide on the entire screen which is what you want in the classroom in zoom or any other similar platform it's probably best to change it to this browse by an individual because what that does is that when you then show the slideshow uh, it means that it's a resizable window uh, that gives you room to look at other windows on the screen when you're working and uh, you can change this to whatever you like and the students will won't see the changes they see it full screen whatever size you're looking at it you can also use that to share and look at another commonly used one you can use it to share a, a video for example uh, so if we do that here in this case if you're sharing a video you want to make sure you click that share sound so here I've got a YouTube video dialed up. Uh, it's a production of Waiting for God Out by, as performed by guinea pigs. Uh, you just go to full screen. You should be hearing audio and seeing it now. We won't have time, unfortunately, to watch the whole thing, but, uh, you know, golly, he's cute. This one allows you to record or stop recording the meeting. Uh, this one allows you to create breakout rooms and you can divide them up as you like, include automatically or manually, much like uh, small discussion groups in a classroom. And that's pretty much it. I found that like any software, it took a bit of getting used to, but it's quicker than most. And once you get a hang of it, it works well. And the students are very forgiving of any technical errors or delays on your part as always. Uh, for myself, the, the main advantages of Zoom for similar video conferencing programs are first and foremost, its ability to let you see 
more than five people on the screen at once, uh, up to 48 students, uh, and plus yourself, and uh, thumbnails after that that allow you to expand it sort of infinitely, uh, up to a thousand with some versions, though I wonder at the human brain's capacity to take in a thousand faces on a screen at once. Uh, the other advantages is simply that I find it very easy to use, and sort of the students. And last but not least, uh, more stable, uh, less susceptible to crashes than uh, Blackboard Collaborate or anything within Quirkus for that matter. That's it. Thank you.